nice. So I'm Alexei. I work at Red Hat. I did uh, lots of concurrency work. And I am the guy who read JLS chapter 17 like 30 times in my life. Um, gradually understood it better and better. And I think I understand it almost completely right now. And so I'm trying to instill the wisdom of this chapter to the, to the masses here. So the only Russian paragraph in this slide is the safe harbor. Um, what you will be seeing in this talk might be a lie. So take it with a grain of salt. If you base your production um, on the advices from this talk, do hire the professional that will help you do that. Um, don't just believe everything that is, it is said on the conferences. OK, so for the theory, um, before you go into the theory of GMM, you have to kind of reformat your brain in understanding where is the place of GMM is the whole picture of things. And as you do that, you have to start with the difference between specification and implementation. And everybody intuitively understands this difference, right? You do understand the difference of what is written in the Java doc for the method and what is really happening inside of, it, inside of the implementation there. Uh, so the specification is kind of the minimal requirements that have to be um, adhered to by every single implement, every possible implementation of that method, and everything inside is implementation details, which are important for performance probably, but not for correctness. If you want to do correct code, you have to adhere to the Java doc, not at the implementation details. And the good specification is the balance. Because if you underspecify the method, and you basically say that the method can do whatever, uh, it's not usable. If it, if it does whatever, I don't know why should I call it? I mean, what it will be doing, what useful things it could be doing for me. And conversely, if you overspecify something, like, you, I don't know, you put the pseudocode into the Java doc, your implementation choices are significantly limited. Um, and this is how you do things for the library code. How do you do this specification work for the language? If you have the programming language, a new programming language, how do you specify it? It turns out if you read these real specs from the real languages, you will realize that there are kind of the two things in the spec. There are the uh, syntax of the language, meaning the construction. How do you spell the constructions in the language? And the semantics of the language. And the semantics is usually described either implicitly or explicitly by the behavior of some abstract machine that executes this, this program. Um, and the unspoken agreement is that if the result of the execution in the real implementation is indistinguishable from some uh, execution of this abstract machine, nobody cares how it was achieved. So we have a Java program on the left, which has like two local variables, and the third local variable has the sum of these two local variables. The conforming implementation can actually compile it down to just, you know, uh, Pre-compute the result, put it into the result register, and you're done. And this result is indistinguishable from abstract machine, so it's, it's allowed. Now, the cunning thing happens when you say, say set the break, break point there, at which point runtime has to uh, you cheat, cheat a little and actually tell you that, well, you know, even though local variables are not really there, here's the view from the abstract machine standpoint how it would be if it was just a plain abstract machine. So the GMM is the part of the abstract machine. It's the part of the abstract machine behavior. If the result is indistinguishable from that behavior, it is allowed. So if I have the program which has volatile and it stores one and two and returns the, uh, the value of this volatile field, it's actually compilable to that, to that code. You can just put two into the register and return that two. Um, notice that volatile in this sense does not mean it breaks uh, optimizations or something like that. This is one of the possible behaviors of the abstract machine, and so it is allowed. Right? So the whole talk idea is that JMM is simple. Really, not joking. Um, and giving these talks over the years, I realized that the problem is educational. Because most of the problem, most of the talks discuss what JMM is about without really calling out the misconceptions that you came with here. Um, and it also, uh, all these things try to cater to the audience by 
Talking about implementation, which muddies, muds the water even more because people get all confused what is actually specified by the GMM and what are the usual implementations do there. So this talk this tries to discuss what GMM is not about. This is the unlearning experience. We will be only talking about the minimal requirements from the GMM, uh, trying not to do implementation. Now, the trouble with the whole thing is that if you go to JLS, and JLS is actually very well written. You can actually read it without getting your headache until you get to the two really murky places there. First is the method dispatch, and the second one is chapter 17, Java memory model, where you are um, graced with these things like given a write, blah, 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 a freeze, blah, 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 blah. And it's just the white noise on the first read and on the second read and on the fifth read too. So a little crash course into how to parse this thing. Um, even though we will be talking about some of the JMM formalism, we will be trying to derive the high level understanding of it so we don't have to dive into this formalism all that much. So JMM, um, uh, is basically centered around the notion of executions. And executions is the union of actions, orders, and consistency rules for it. And it's also white noise on the 10th read. Uh, the important thing to understand is that the executions are the behaviors of this abstract machine. They are not the execution of your real you know, JVM compiled program. And these executions define all the possible Java, pro uh, the ways Java program can execute and all the possible conforming implementation. This is the very abstract thing. Uh, the usual nomenclature that you would use is that the actions are, are like this. If you want to describe that the, some this abstract program has written the value V into the field, you say it's V field V. Uh, if, it's, if it read something from the field, it will be described like that, locking and unlocking the monitor. Um, and then you're just taking a deep breath. You go to the orders, which say, you know, there are synchronization order happens before, synchronizes with, and the actions are kind of uh, conglomerated in these orders. And you get the execution, and you have the consistency rule that describes this behavior, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At end, the end, you just feel like, I mean. Um, okay, I can read it 10 times. It doesn't mean I necessarily understand it better. So um, a little bit of reformatting how to think about this. So suppose you have this original program. And to reason how it performs, you have to employ JMM rules. So suppose this is the original program. And this is the usual uh, nomenclature how you describe multi-threaded programs. Everything on the top, like int a0, is something that had happened already initialization steps. And the columns are the threads. So in this example, the thread 1 stores a to 1, sorry, 1 to a, uh, and then it reads a to the local variable. By convention, in these examples, r1, r2, et cetera, are local variables. And the second, three is, uh, second thread just stores 2 to a. So what JMM does, it says, OK, having this program, what are the possible executions that can happen ever for this program? And you will have these executions. You will say, you know, there is execution where I store 1 to A. Uh, then I have the read of 1 from A. And those are kind of connected by happens before. And there is the unordered read of write of uh, 2 to A. And there is the uh, similar execution which reads 2 from A. Um, how do you arrive from these programs to the GMM rule is the hard part of GMM. How do you construct these things? But once you constructed all these possible executions, you get the outcomes. You get what is possible in your Java program in any possible implementation out there. Now, when implementation comes in, it says, gee, if I want to compile this, the code in this thread, I can actually compile it to this. I can actually say, hey, store 1 to A. And oh, by the way, we, st we have stored we store this one to A, and so we can store the same one to R1, which yields the result one. Now not notice that the only convention that you have here is that the implementation produced the results that are the subset of something allowed by the specification, but not all of them, right? And this is the first takeaway. The implementations are allowed to produce the subset of allowed outcomes 
they are not required to produce all of them, which means that you can study the implementation, but it doesn't really tell you the whole picture. So if you have this, like, the whole realm of uh, allowed behaviors for GMM, if you, uh, how many of you read the GSR-133 cookbook for compiler writers? Yeah. There's the uh, very interesting uh, uh, paper there. We will describe it a little bit. Uh, but suppose you have this all the realms of Java memory model executions, and you have the implementation that kind of produces only the subset of these requirements there. There's reduction at absurdum if you have the implementation that takes the log during interpretation or compilation. You will still be conformant JMM-wise. You would not be as performant. But it, it will still be, you know, it will still get the subset of these rules. Um, so the people who are exposed to the algebraic derivations of GMM, they just Google stuff, and they come out to the GSR-133 cookbook for compiler writers, which says, hey, if you want to have a JMM-compatible runtime, this is what you do. If you have a volatile load, you have to make sure that the operations after volatile load are not reordered before it, so you just emit the barrier after the volatile load. You do the same thing for volatile stores. You don't reorder things that are before volatile store after the volatile store, so you have to, uh, to do barriers before the volatile store. And since you want uh, volatile loads and volatile stores not to reorder, you also have to have a, a store load barrier somewhere there. Uh, you do the same thing for synchronized, you do a little bit of stuff for final fields, and you're done. And it's really easy to think about, right? Because uh, okay, the, you can map this to your code and derive the behaviors from there. But as I said on the previous slide, it's just the, one of the possible implementations not always uh, cover all the cases that you, you might get. And the golden example of where it fails to give you the results that is actually allowed is log coarsening. And log coarsening is the interesting optimization hotspot. It says, if you have these two smallish logs, you can actually merge them into one single log there. And after you merge it, um, you can probably do reordering stuff within that synchronized block, because GMM apparently allows it. If you just translate this thing through the cookbook, it will say, you know, before entering and exit, exiting the log, you have to put these barriers around your code. And now, if you ask yourself a question, can you reorder the stores of X and Y, you will look, look there, and you realize there is a store-store barriers between these writes, because cookbook kind of mandates it. And so you cannot really reorder this thing. So cookbook says, no, you can't. Um, JMM says, yeah, sure you can. I mean, if you do the theoretical derivation, uh, if this result is plausible, yes, you can do that. And Hotspot does it. Um, so the barriers imp interpretation is kind of tricky, it's implementation detail. So every time you see in the code something like this, you say, you know, I have the method barrier, which has the empty synchronized log there, and cookbook, uh, on, on the internet, I googled that cookbook says that after the synchronized, I have to have the barrier. So obviously this is a barrier, right? This is implementation detail. This is not mandated by spec. This is also not mandated by spec that you have this, the barriers from the volatiles. This is also not mandated by spec. This is just the implementation details. Relying on this is harmful. So what do you do if you can't rely on this simple interpretation? You actually learn the minimal set of requirements that GMM imposes on you. And to understand those better, you have to go through very model and simple examples. So the first very model, very synthetic, uh, very small example. Suppose you have the class M, you have the global variable when it's stored, and you have the first thread that momentarily puts the instance of M there, and it nulls it right away. And the second thread reads it into the local variable and null checks it twice. So R1 and R2 are obviously booleans. Uh, what do you think are the plausible executions of this thing under the GMM rules? What GMM says are the good results for R1 and R2? Who is for true true, for instance? Is it valid? Sure, it's valid. You just do, you know, um, you just do the new M in one thread, switch to other thread. Now check both, both are true. 
Then you do the store. Who is for false false? Yeah, it kinda, uh, it's kind of also kind of simple there. And if you do the derivations through GMM, uh, you will realize that these are the only plausible results there. But if you look at this, and if you learn from all the great talks that talk to you about compiler optimizations, you say, hey, there's, there's a counter-argument. Why can't compile, compiler inline this local variable? And say, if there was a local variable, so why bother? Why, why don't we just read it twice? Uh, there. So the interesting result is whether we can have something else from R1 and R2, not just true true or false false. Well, G, if you look at this program, JMM says, hey, there is an execution that produces true and false now because the second uh, read of M can actually observe the, the store to null, right? And the first read can observe this, the actual store of M. And this is, by the way, the justifying execution from the JMM rules, so this is obviously allowed, right? Um, and this is where we are coming to the first bit of the JMM formalism, which is called program order. And program order is the weird thing in JMM formalism. It says, basically, uh, that some of the actions in your executions are connected by this, by this special relation, which basically describe the structure of your original program in this program order. And it comes with the, this interesting consistency rule, which says you can construct whatever uh, execution with whatever program order mode you have. But if you want to reason about a particular program, you have to make sure that the execution that you are having is um, consistent with your, your program order. And here is the, the example, that example rephrased. So if you have this program, original one, with a single read, the relatable executions are on that form. You have the, write, the writes in the other threads and the single read there. And these are the executions for the modified program. Now the spec says that this execution there does not rely, relate to the original program. Because you have two reads here, but the original program has only one. And you only have to use this execution to reason about the program, which in practical terms says to us that if the original program had a single read, that the relatable executions always ha also have single read. And this is, you might think this is not an essential property for the language, but it's actually very useful for the things like this. When you read something from the heap, you check it for nullness. If it's not null, you dereference through it. This program order thing is actually the building block for the benign data races that you can recover. By the way, in C and C++, this is not guaranteed. In C and C++, data races undefined behavior and compiler can actually inline the uh, access to M there, and all of a sudden you have the crash, even though you null checked your reference just before it, which is creepy, but it is allowed in C and C++, it's not allowed in Java. Yay! So takeaway number three, data race behavior is somewhat deterministic. Uh, weird stuff still happens there, but it's not completely catastrophic. So you can recover from some of these things. And memory model-wise, there is a difference between reading from heap and storing something into the local, uh, into local variable. In the performance talks, people would tell you that you don't, you know, don't bother introducing local variables because smart VM will figure out how to call as the heap reads. From the concurrency perspective, these two cases are really different because in this program, I do have actual two reads which introduces interesting behaviors, uh, and there I have a single read. If, I, if you look through the very um, intricate concurrency code, you will see that the people who write that code are actually very careful about where they read the heap and which order they do this, and et cetera, et cetera. They don't just you know, believe that everything, everything would be handled by um, runtime itself. Um, and another takeaway. Um, if we kind of try to characterize the properties of the accesses, um, we can build a very nice table, and this is only the part of it. We can say, okay, um, is the read from the particular variable in, in, is in some sense definite or not? And in Java, 
if you do the plain reads or volatile reads, it's, defin it's definite. Um, in Java 9, you have the special var handles, which kind of provide you the options in the middle, and you will see how it goes as we build this table going forward. Um, this thing here, if I had the column for C and C++, uh, C and C++ plain operations would just take the first row there. It's just undefined behavior. You're basically screwed if you have data races there. So the next thing, coherence. And coherence is better explained by this thing. Suppose you have integer field x, and you store one in one thread, and the other thread you read it twice. What do you think are plausible results for this program? There are, you know, how do you solve these puzzles? Well, you knock out the obvious things first. Uh, suppose the first thread ran before another. Right? Suppose the first thread ran uh, and stored x1. The obvious result is 1, 1, right? Suppose the, uh, the vice versa, the first thread run read both zeros, so it's 0, 0. Now, uh, so what about 0 and 1? Also obvious, right? The first statement executes there, then the store, then the second read. What about, um, zero, uh, what about 1 and 0? So can you read zero, uh, sorry, 1 once and then 0? Can you do it? Is, is this the plausible under JMM? Uh, JMM actually allows to observe it. This is the conforming execution that v justifies this result. Even though there are both reads in these executions, they are in damn program order. And lo and behold, this execution is actually program order and consistent. What do you want? Both, you wanted two reads. These are your two reads. Nobody really said what you should observe by re while reading those, but the structure of execution is here. Here you go. Um, if you want to avoid this result, the property that you are after is called coherence. It says that the writes to the single location appear to be in the total order consistent with the program order. Notice that this is not the total order uh, around the, all the operations in the program. It's only for the single location. And most hardware uh, actually gives you this for free. The coherency protocols kind of have the single consistent view of the one particular uh, piece of memory at all times. They are get confused when you have multiple updates in flight, and the order between those updates gets confusing. But the most optimizers actually uh, don't care about all that much. They don't track the order of reads all that much, uh, so they can mess you up there. So how do we avoid this in memory model? You need to have the consistency rules that affects not only the structure of the execution, but also the values that you read. And in JMM, there are two kinds of, two types of uh, consistency rules. Happens before consistency and synchronization order consistency. And we will be talking about this one now. Um, so what is synchronization order? Um, there are special kinds of execution, uh, sorry, actions in the program, synchronized actions. The actions over the special objects, special entities in your language. Volatiles, logs, some special synthetic things like thread start, etc. Now the useful things about synchronization order is that it's the total order. So all the actions in this uh, um, order are connected with each other and comes with two interesting consistency rules. First is that if you have the execution and you have the program order, which mandate, mandated that the, some of the operations are in program order in this particular way, synchronization order should agree with it. And the other thing uh, that actually concerns the values that you observe in your reads, it says that the reads uh, in your synchronization order have to observe the latest reads in SO. If you stare at it long enough, you will realize this is what coherency wants. Basically, it wants the total order, which is consistent with program order, and the values, you know, and the values that you read appear, apparently form this total order. So if you rephrase this example with volatile, how do you, what justifying executions for this program can you find in JMM? It turns out that the executions uh, like this, that yield 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, um, now that this variable is volatile, all the actions that are associated with it are synchronization actions. They are special. They are in synchronization order. Synchronization order is total. All these three actions are connected. 
And if I have to reason about what, what the various reads can see from there, I have to employ consistency rule and say, if I have this read here, R1, uh, I have to observe the previous, right? If I have this read here, it doesn't have to observe uh, this right here because the synchronization order is the other thing. If you derive all the possible synchronizations order for this program, you will realize that these are the only execution, only outcomes for this program ever, which means that the one zero, if X is volatile, is actually forbidden. But this is the hard thing to do. Uh, hardly anyone can do this regularly without mistakes. So it's uh, more useful to remember the high-level properties. And the high-level property is coherence. Uh, so races basically laugh about your presuppositions about the program order or the statement order or whatever. It's mostly completely free for all there. Well, hardware kind of does the, uh, the right, right thing although it's arguable it's a, if it is the right thing. Optimizers exploit this all the time. And coherency, while the, it feels like a basic property, it's not guaranteed for the plain reads. If you do something stronger like volatile, so synchronized, or exotic modes of war handles, you, you do that. You can have that. So we will be building our table next. So volatiles are coherent, all good, plain, uh, fields are not coherent, not good. There's the exotic mode in var handles, which provides you the coherency, although not, not, not much else on top of that. All right, causality. Causality is the bad word because it has lots of overloading meanings, but we will be talking about one specific meaning of it. Uh, how do you uh, do the cause and effect things in your programs? To do that, we have to learn a few things about JMM again. In JMM, there is this special order, which is called synchronization order, which connects two uh, synchronization actions if they see each other and it's a partial order, blah, blah, blah. White noise, if you ask me. But it's the uh, important bit for giving you happens before. Happens before is defined as the union uh, as the transitive closure over the union of program order and synchronized with order. And this is the really academic um, explanation of this. The more down to the ground explanation is that uh, program order basically gives you the relation within the threads, synchron synchronizes with, gives you the bridge between the threads over the special actions. And so happens before gives you the effects between the threads. Happens before comes with important consistency rule, which affects values. Um, and it's tricky that it has to, the actions there has to observe the latest write in happens before order or any other write not ordered by happens before. Now, if we didn't have the second clause there, it would look as synchronization order if happens before was also total. Uh, but this thing actually allows races. So if you have the race series somewhere, non-synchronized, happens before allows to observe it. And it's uh, most evident at the simple examples like this. Uh, suppose you have field X, which is not volatile, field Y, which is volatile, and you have this program. How do you reason about the behaviors of this program from JMM standpoint? Well, there are four statements there. They will produce executions with four actions. And this is the class of executions we are looking at. So you have the writes in, in one thread and reads in the other thread. They are pairwise connected by program order because they are like that in the original program. And you have to reason what are the values those reads can observe to yield the plausible executions there. And it turns out if you just enumerate those things, you will realize there is the race subclass of executions where you don't see any value of Y and then you can observe whatever value at X, either zero or one, even though happens before through the program order says to us that those things are pairwise connected by happens before, both things are actually happens before consistence. If I, if I want to see uh, if a particular, what can a particular read see? So suppose I have the second execution when 
uh, I see one at X. If this happens before consistent, it's, it apparently sees the write all the way at the beginning, but this is explicitly allowed by the consistency rule. It doesn't really, um, it's the racy read basically. It doesn't connect it by happens before. It is allowed there. And non-racy subclass, if I have observed this Y uh, value there, uh, since Y is special, since it's volatile, it's a synchronization action. There is this synchronizes with between those two actions. There is happens before because of that. Since it happens before transitive, now the second execution is not happens before consistent because the last read had to observe the first write, which is before it and happens before order. And I cannot use this execution to justify the outcome of the program. And since I enumerated all the possible executions and no executions uh, give you me this outcome, this outcome is forbidden in JMM. This is how you prove it in JMM, which is also kind of hard when you do it the first or the second or the third time. Um, but notice a few things here. First, that happens before is defined over actions, not over statements. So if you see on the internet that people just argue that see the statement here, which R1 equals Y, and it happens before the store somewhere, it's just, you know, it's wrong. Uh, you can only reason about happens before uh, with the action, with the actual things that happens, uh, that program did, not what is written in your you know, template in your source code. And notice that if I have this bridge between the actions, right, which gives me happens before, uh, the executions like this kind of violates happens before consistency, in, in, this is in the academic terms. In practical terms, it looks as if I observed this special value of y, and it caused me to observe the values that were uh, written before the store of that y. This is the whole thing there. Um, in order to understand this better, uh, let's look at the counterexample. And this is where people get all confused when they study barriers. This is the, almost the same example, but the order is different. You first do the volatile store, then the store, and do the non-volatile read, then volatile read. Now, the surprising behavior is that one and zero are not now allowed, because this is the justifying execution for it. The thread just did two writes, they aren't happens before, fine, but there is no bridge between the threads. So the other pair says, I read one and then I read zero, and it's freaking irrelevant that Y is volatile at this point. It is the racy read, you get surprising behavior. You can probably la language lawyer this with the barriers to convince yourself that this is an implausible result. But in JMAM, this is the simple, derivation that, that gives you that. So all this thing can be simplified into the crucial realization, which is usually called safe publication. It says that uh, if I have the special operations in my program, which gives rise to the synchronization actions, I can say that this bridge between the threads uh, kind of passes the state between the threads. And I can name the endpoints of this bridge. I can name the, uh, one of the endpoints release when I kind of, yeah, kind of release my memory to someone. And the other endpoint acquire when I get all this thing and I can read it. It looks as if the first thread kind of committed to memory, but not really. And the other thread just, you know, if it observed what was, what was released by this witness, it is there. So the major takeaway is not to think about JMM rules because they are hard to get right, but rather think about in this high level rules. The safe publication is basically the major and the simplest rule you can do from JMM that you can use in day to day life. So how you do, do this, you just identify your acquires, identify your releases, check that acquires and releases are on all paths between the threads, and that's about it. And this is a simple, just a simple mnemonic. Just uh, if you want to send something to your friend, you pack it up, you release it. The other fr your friend just acquires it, unpacks it, and then it can read something from there. It's a simple, you know, mechanical 
mechanical interpretation that you can, you can use to reason about your programs. So from the ordering modes, volatiles provide you these causality rules. Uh, plane reads do not provide you with causality rules. There's the middle ground in var handles that even, even, is even called explicitly acquired in release to give you this, this property there. Uh, consensus. Consensus is a weird one. Um, because if you study the programs like this, um, when you have four threads, and one of those thre uh, two of those threads just store the value of y uh, of to y and x, and the other two just reading it, it turns out that it's sur it would be surprising to see r one zero r one sorry one and one, and then see zero and zero. It looks as if the other two threads have seen the updates to x and y in different order, right? That would be confusing if you want to have the system to get the momentarily understanding of the single global state of your memory, right? If you do this with the happens before alone, there are justifying executions that give you this result because happens before is partial order, it, doesn't, it isn't strong enough. Um, if you look at the literature, what is the name of this property that you want? It turns out the Lampert defined it for you. It's sequential consistency. It says, you know, the program is sequentially consistent if the result of any execution is as if all the processors executed this program in some sequential order, which is consistent with program order. Now, does it sound familiar to you? Anyone? <laughs> In JMM, it's the synchronization order, basically. It, 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 it's what it is. It's total order. It's consistent with program order. And it gives you values um, in, in, right, in all the right things. So take away number six. Um, sequential, you want sequential consistency. You want consensus in your code. You have to go full volatile or full synchronized or full whatever strong mode that you have. And sequential consistency is not always needed. Notice that the examples in examples before for the causality and the happens before things, we got away with our sequential consistency fine. This is actually the stronger thing that you need to, to have if you say build logs or some coordination primitives. If you just want to pass value between threads, release acquire is enough. Consensus is really needed in, in a few rare cases. All right, so the ordering modes, the uh, volatiles gives you this consensus, not anything else gives you this. Acquire release is weaker. It just gives you uh, basically causality. Um, so yeah, there's that. Finals. Finals are weird. The weirdest part in JMM. All of the other things are actually simple. Finals are kind of uh. So we have this program. It has the final field x, and I initialize it to 42, and I store it in some m, and I read it from heap, and I null check it. Uh, what are the possible values for r1 for this program, as jmm states? Who is for 0? Who is for 1? Certainly, you can read null, and r1 would be null, would be 1. Uh, who is for 42? All right. So yeah, JMM basically says, yes, if that field is final, then it's 1 or 42. Uh, and it comes from the special, very special JMM rule, which basically says, oh, sorry. Which basically says that the writes to the final fields happens before reads of the final fields, assuming you have some prerequisite set there. And we will talk about them. And the derivation from that rule is really, really complicated. Let's not think about that, because it will get confusing very quickly. But the example that, you, that I want you to show is that suppose you don't have final there. Suppose you have volatile. What are the plausible results right now for this program? Are there any new results compared to the final case? Yeah, you can have zero, because now this is a freaking race. And I can observe whatever value for that volatile field. So if you um, ever come to this question, whether the volatile is subset of final or final is the subset of volatile, the answer is neither. 
they are they intersect a little bit in their semantics, but they are really about different things there. This is the creepy thing about <clears throat> memory model, and it, it's the first thing to fix there. But anyway, the whole thing could be generalized to the notion of safe construction. It says, you know, if your fields are final and you have not leaked this from the constructor, that means your object can actually survive races. Because the, field, the things that you will read from these final fields would be consistent, which gives you the, the interesting construction, which is called benign race. And benign race looks like this. Suppose you have this object V, which, is, which have constructors that assume uh, safe construction there. You can do the methods like this. You can say, I do a single racy read. I check if I have read not null thing from there. If I did, uh, final field semantics uh, guarantees me that I will observe the values there intact. If I don't see it uh, as not null, I do the recovery step, produce something for myself here, and return that, that instead. And you can see that in the JDK class libraries like this. If you look at the abstract collection, for instance, which has the key set and value set views of the collection, it it's written like that. Uh, you don't want to have key set volatile for uh, you know, low level optimization reasons that you might have to consider if you build the class library that is used by 10 million people. Um, so it basically goes like this. It says non volatile key set. I read it once. I check that it's not null. If it is, then I do the recovery, construct the key set with all the final fields, and I'm done. So the takeaway from here is that safe construction is another major and somewhat simple rule. Um, I, I'm not advocating using it to avoid synchronization, but it's an interesting defense in depth strategy. If you are not sure that your object would be properly published everywhere, it, it's a good idea to just do the safe construction thing to cover for those cases. Benign races are sometimes useful um, unless you screw it up, unless you screw up one of those three rules there. And the logs. Um, one of the sad realizations that I had is just, you can talk about volatiles for hours and then people come to you and say, well, you know, you, you said all these nice things about volatiles. So what about the memory ordering for synchronized? And if you read the spec, you will see that there is a nice memory ordering symmetry between synchronized and volatile things. Basically, if you have volatile write, volatile read, you can basically, um, without loss of generality, usually replace it with the lock and unlock. But the things that locks get you, they get you all the ordering that you would expect from volatiles and one magical property on the top, which is mutual exclusion. Volatiles cannot forbid the thread from entering the code that is past its volatile read. Synchronized block can, or the lock can. Right? But otherwise, it has the same memory semantics there. So summing up, golden rule that you, that you need to learn. You don't, you're not expected to do JMM derivations or JMM proofs in your day-to-day -day life. Nobody can do that reliably. I only did this to, uh, to show you how complex it might get. This is the actual golden rule that you have to use. If you want to pass data between threads, you store everything in one thread, you do the release in the other thread, you do the acquire and then read anything that you want there. And it automatically happens with well-designed concurrency primitives. Say if you have concurrent queue and you push something to the queue and you pull something from the queue in the other thread, all this thing automatically works because push is the release, pull is the acquire. It has to happen on all possible execution paths in all the correct orders. Rule number two, safe construction. When in doubt, make on fields final. Uh, that allows you to survive races. Uh, and it is also a defense in depth strategy. The other two rules are not really recommended. But still, uh, you want to have benign races. If you want to have benign races, then you have to prove that those are really, really benign. And there are also exotic rules, exotic modes, like non-volatile um, and non-plain, something in the middle. And just don't do that 
until you master your volatile things. First prove that you can use volatile, then we can talk about using uh, exotic modes there. If you do, if you're the library writer which cares um, exclusively about performance, uh, then you might probably consider var handles in this exotic mode. But all of this is nothing without practice. I mean, you, you can just stand up right now, and five minutes later, you will not remember the single thing that I've said in this talk. Or what's worse, you will remember things that I never said in this talk. So for the practice, what is the best vehicle for the practicing memory model here? Yeah, of course, double check locking, and right? If you show this, people to, uh, show this example to the people who go on interviews, they will just pattern match it and say, hey, but this is double check locking. It doesn't work without volatile, so you have to do volatile there. Um, but if you ask them, why do you need volatile there? They will say, well, because double check locking does not work without volatile. Duh, obviously. Uh, but with our newly acquired knowledge, we can actually ask the smarter question, what are the ordering modes that are need on the axis to this volatile thing there? Volatile is kind of uh, gives you everything with the cherry on top, but we can reason about what are the minimal things that are needed in all these cases. Think about it for a minute. I'll take a sip. So not to stress you out, suppose you're interviewing for the very high level position right now. Like 15 seconds to go. Uh, now, how do you reason about this? Well, if, if I had the synchronized, which was kind of encompassed the whole method, the issue was not, right? If get was synchronized, synchronized gives you, me everything. The troublesome thing is this vol is the read of vol, which is outside synchronized. So it has to be special. How special? What should be, what it should be? It's the coherence, acquire release, consensus, what is? So you need acquire there. And if you need acquire at one, you have to have the paired release. Where's, where's that release? Three, yes, you need to release and acquire here. This is the property that you are after. You are somewhat after the coherence property here, but it's less relevant if this thing is volatile. Anyway, um, if you do this with work handles, you can actually explicitly do uh, acquire and release like that. This is the minimal example that you, you do there. But this is DCL. Let's do some, something a little bit more practical. So say it's lazy V, it's the lazy val implementation. You pass the supplier to it, uh, and you expect that multiple threads calling to get will get the one and only value from that supplier. This obviously work, right? Who thinks it works? Oh, come on. It couldn't be the mistake in the very first example, right? So yes, it does work. I mean, synchronized method gives you everything with the cherry on top. But let's optimize it a little. When uh, entering the synchronized method on every get is kind of excessive, don't you think? You want to have uh, you know, fast path from there. So how do you optimize it? Yeah, see, you, you all know what double check locking is. Now it's time to learn to apply it. So you apply DCL to this example, and this is what you do. You say, okay, we just do the DCL. We just say, we have this volatile V, we check it, and we, if it's now, we enter the recovery path and we call the supplier once, and that's it. Does it still work? Who is for, for yes? I mean, sure. Who's for no? Okay, this still works. Um, and most of the most people should just really stop here. You know, DCL works. This is the pattern for DCL. It's obviously correct. But yeah, uh, no quiet for us. Let's polish it a bit. If you're micro optimizing, you realize that after the first call to suppliers, the supplier is not really needed, and it's Java object. You don't want to retain it in your lazy val. So maybe you should drop it. And you could do that if you just, you know, after this as get, you just say s equals now, and you're done. But then you realize, oh, gee, while we are doing this, let's also fix an interesting bug. What if supplier returns now itself? 
If it does, we will enter the synchronized section all the time. So maybe we should use this, uh, the existence of supplier in our lazy val as the sensing flag for whether we had initialized this value or not. So what do you do? You say, okay, fine. We will do as null, but we also, before jumping into the synchronized section, we do check for supplier. And now you have a tricky question. Now it looks as if DCL, but not quite. And now you have two fields, and you have to decide where to put volatile now for this thing to work. So there are basically three uh, serious uh, cases here, either to vol or to supplier or to both supplier and vol. So who is for the case number one, for A? Who is for, for B? Who is for both? I actually like the guys who do case C because if you're not sure where to put volatiles, put it freaking everywhere. <laughs> it's easier to have the excess, excessive volatile and have correctness rather than get out the volatile from the unconve unconventional place and have the functional bug somewhere. But let's roll over the, the cases and see if it's broken or not. Let's just put volatile to V. Any problems here? And the example kind of hints where the problem lies. Can you spot it? What is the problem? Yeah. So you basically um, release a query is misplaced. This S thing is not synchronized, right? It, does, it misses the volatile. So this is where it gets uh, all uh, f freaked out. And you can miss the things about V. You can actually return V now. And after you scratch your head, how did that happen? You can get back to this example, which basically the same damn thing. You have this volatile V, but it doesn't matter because you, have, you did this racy thing there. Right? So this is bad. Okay. Uh, let's do the other thing. Let's put volatile to S. Does it work now? You can return null. No, you can't. You can prove that you can't. Um, and I would say to you that this example is actually correct because now S is volatile, so we have all the proper release and acquires thing. And notice that release and acquires works here because I do the stores to V, then I do the releasing store to S, and the other thread I do acquiring read of S, and then I have V. And this is the pattern that I am after. Pack, every, pack your shit up, release, acquire, unpack. This is what it is. All right. But then you say to yourself, hey, but gee, volatiles, volatiles are so costly, so maybe we can avoid this, right? Um, I don't really like this volatile read. And you will think to yourself, hey, well, why don't we just check if V is null? If it's not, then we can probably return it right away. And if it is, then we have to you know, do, this, do this path here. So basically do this, right? Check V for null. If it isn't, it's already there. You can return it. No problem there, right? Is there any problem? There are actually two problems. What are, what are the problems? Yeah. So the first problem is uh, more, more cunning. It's a coherence thing again. This is non-volatile thing here. So even though you null checked V once, reading from heap, it doesn't really guarantee that the second read does not return null for you. And if you, again, scratch your head, how did that happen? This is the same example as we did here, right? Racy read, non -co not coherent. That sucks. Okay, how do you solve this kind of problem? You do the single read, right? Like this. You read it once, you null check that local variable and return that local variable. Does it still work? Now it's the second problem. The second problem is, hey, well, we are smart, but not smart enough. No release acquire on this path. And we are basically to, to square one. The contents of V are garbled at that point. Okay? 
So the conclusions, if you just draw the face space of the, all the things that you encounter in your concurrency stuff, and you have this happiness thing here, it turns out there is the only the single happy plateau in this in this realm, which are basically um, you know safe construction, safe initialization rules. You have this kind of benign races which can quickly deteriorate your happiness after you start working with them, and everything else is just the sea of despair there. So in four paragraphs, the safe publication, safe constructions are the cases that are the things that cover 99% of all of the cases you will ever encounter in your real life. So you, you learn those two rules and you are all set. And in some very um, diminishing number of cases, you can get away with benign races. Everything else, including reasoning about what optimizers do, what is set in GMM, what this hardware does, while it's the good and interesting pieces of trivia that you can uh, talk on con at conferences, it doesn't really constitute a rigorous proof. If you want the rigorous proofs, you have to do JMM rules. But the point is, you don't have to do this if you just know these two rules. OK? So, and the parting thought, you don't really have to be smart to write uh, correct and efficient concurrency code. But you have to be extra smart if you try to bend the rules just a little bit. OK? For the reading, in the uh, ascending order of difficulty, Learning about these basic rules, just, you know, you can read that blog. If you want to learn more about JMM, Java memory model pragmatics or close encounters are the good reads there. And if you want to learn about var handles and the exotic modes, Doug Lee has a very nice uh, page that describes all the academic side of horrors uh, with, with these things. And for that, I'm over time and I'm done. I have a backup session uh, section with more examples. Ha <laughs> ha.